Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Superhumans at Work. This is your host, Jason Mark Campbell, and I'm so excited for today's episode because we have a legend in the field of business building, entrepreneurship, and CEO of excellence. Jeff Hoffman is an entrepreneur. He's spoken on multiple stages. He's written books, and he's now a humanitarian as well, where he is the man behind some of the successes of companies you may have heard of, such as Booking.com, UBID, and he serves on the boards of several companies across the world, and he supports entrepreneurs and small business owners worldwide. He is the chairman of the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which works with entrepreneurs in 180 countries and is on the founding board member for the Unreasonable Group. He supports the White House, the State Department, the United Nations, and similar organizations internationally on economic growth initiatives and entrepreneurship program. He's been featured on publications such as Fox News, Fox Business, CNN, Bloomberg, CNS, CNBC, ABC, NPR, pretty much everywhere around the world. His accolades are amazing. He's spoken around the world. He's an engaging storyteller, and he is here with us on Superhumans at Work, sharing his wisdom, Jeff Hoffman. It's a pleasure to have you. Jason, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm Jeff. just laughing because now we're out of time. <laughs> we're out of time. I had to read all your accolades. I actually cut it. You could have just said, hey, this is Jeff. I would have been happy with that. All right, everybody, let's have Jeff speak here. He's going to share some wisdom. You, you'll find out how awesome he is once we go through these topics. But honestly, Jeff, I'm reading your bio. It's so impressive. And, you know, Amanda has done so many things such as you is, is quite an honor to have sharing your wisdom here. You, you've also written your book, Scale, The Seven Proven Principles to Grow Your Business and Get Your Life Back. And so you come across to me as someone who's been a hardcore entrepreneur, a powerful CEO, yet you also have a great balance in your life. And so I feel like that probably didn't happen all at the same time. So I'd love to give you some time to kind of walk us through your journey. Like how did you end up being someone that goes into businesses, scales businesses, makes them successful? What's going on here? Who's this Jeff guy? <laughs> so uh, you're right, by the way, that doesn't happen all at the same time, uh, which is part of why now that I have a white colored beard, I am trying to share anything I've learned uh, with anybody I can share it with, which is why I'm honored to be on your podcast here. Um, there's a lot of mistakes I made along the way that I was thinking somebody knew I should not have turned left here. Why can't they tell me? So my commitment is to give back by sharing everything we've learned. We are blessed enough that several of these companies we created scaled into multi-billion dollar global companies and we made note of what worked along the way. Um, so for me, just very quickly, uh, I'm an engineer by trade, a software engineer. Um, and, you know, I got a corporate job. And remember, uh, you know, you and I aren't talking about right or wrong. We're talking about DNA. Everybody should follow their path. So the corporate America path wasn't for me. Um, and, uh, you know, what I desired in life wasn't money per se, it was freedom, right? Uh, freedom's a byproduct, you know, money's a, a prerequisite of freedom. But I was focused on freedom because I wanted to live a life that I would look back one day and say, man, what a ride, right? I wanted to say I used my time well, and I did the things I wanted to do. And I kept hearing people say, Jason, that, that the reason they couldn't live the life they wanted was because of their job, right? I got responsibilities, Jeff. I got a mortgage. We got kids now. And I want to say this to your listeners. Um, your job, your career should not be, your career should be the vehicle that takes you to the places you want to go, not the obstacle that prevents you from getting there. So I quit my engineering job because my life's dream was to go see the world. And I grew up in a small town where no one had any money and no one saw anything. And I realized no one was going to take me on a trip around the world. So the only way I was going to get it was to create my own future. The whole beauty of being an entrepreneur is the opportunity to design your own future. So I quit. And the very first thing I ever started, and again, I'll do this quickly, but the very first thing I ever started was I was sitting there thinking, if my job is the, it has two goals, to pay the bills, but to allow me to live my version of an epic life, which is what I want all your listeners to, to answer, what's your epic life and what are you doing to build it? Then I'm gonna have to create that. So I wanted to create a travel company. And my very first company ever uh, happened to be the, uh, when you go to an airport and you check yourself in at a kiosk uh, and print your boarding pass, that was my first product. You used to have to wait in a long line in the airport. I was trying to find a way to go see the world and get paid to do it. Uh, because that was my dream and my responsibility. And I said, how do I do these together? And when I came up with that idea, because I was, that was intentionally trying to find that, um, I created those kiosks. And it's like every airport in the world and every airline wanted one. And all of a sudden, I'm flying all over the world to sell my kiosks. 
seeing the world and getting paid to do it. So that was kind of the launch point for me was discovering or proving to myself that dreams aren't irresponsible. You just got to build a business out of them. Mm. Now, I love how right now I've already detected that you seem to have a trend in the kinds of businesses you got involved with that also supported the things you wanted to have support in your life. So now you're here, you're going in the airports, travel is being unlocked as you build a business that we take for granted. We all go to these kiosks now. And then you also got involved with um, Priceline.com and Booking.com. Now it sounds like you're trying to travel and going to different, is it hotels? Like how did you transition into that? Because it seems very related. It, it, it absolutely is. Um, you know, the reason that, that I was part of that uh, when our little team got together to go build that was for the same reason. How do we uh, live a life where we're creating value, meaning getting paid, achieving economic freedom, as, and being able to do whatever it is that you want to do? If, you, if your dream is to be sitting on the front row on the runway at Fashion Week, then you should be launching a fashion company that creates a product that everybody in Fashion Week wants. The key to living an epic life, Jason, is to become valuable to the people you want to be around. I wanted every airline in the world to call me, so I had to give them a reason to. If you want the fashion designers to call you, you have to give them a reason to. You become valuable by becoming the go-to person for the industry you want, you want to be in, and you become the go-to person by solving a problem that they need solved, and you solve a problem by staying up all night and studying an industry. So that's the common element in each of my stories was, We stayed up all night and studied industries and looked for a space where we could come in and create a better solution so that everybody would be calling us. That way, we got to be in the industry, we got to sit on the front row, and we got paid to do it. And, you know, that's why later after, uh, obviously, company PricelineBooking.com, that company scaled uh, uh, globally and became, uh, again, a multi-billion dollar company, as did UBID. But that's what enabled me later, that formula to go start a music company and a film company. Because what I did was I stayed up all night and trying to find a problem they would solve so that I would become valuable to the key players in the industry. So suddenly I would be the go-to person that people were calling. That's the simple formula uh, to honestly, to go live your own epic life. What is it you wanna do? You need to become valuable to those people. So there you have it, everybody. (laughs) I have to dig on deeper here, Jeff, because this sounds incredible. And when you say it, I'm like, okay, it's, it, that sounds pretty logical. I think I can do that. But I would assume there's a few core skills you need to develop to become that person that's valuable. I mean, in your case, my assumption here is you have this software engineering skill set that allowed you to be able to program or see software. I don't know if this was it. Are there these types of skill sets that I can develop today before I jump in and become a person that looks at these industries? Because already sure. I, I love the way your mind thinks. I will give you two really critical ones. By the way, quick funny story. I thought I was a pretty good software engineer just until one day sitting at my own company. My engineers, everybody's staring at me. Jason and I'm like, what's going on, guys? And they're like, yeah, Jeff, could you just back away from the keyboard for a minute? And I said, sure, why? And they said, we're going to need you to stop coding. And I said, why? And they're like, dude, you're like the worst programmer ever. And I said, okay, but I own this company. And they said, somehow you're the worst developer here. And I said, We all have a computer science degree, and they said, and somehow the rest of us learned it. (laughs) And so my engineering skills did not last long. I said, what do you guys want me to do? And they said, go figure out how to market and sell, because as soon as this product's done, somebody's got to sell it. So I wound up being way more on the marketing, more than the sales side in my life. But here's the thing. There were two skills looking back that I think are absolutely critical. And you and I were chatting earlier about scale, right? That one book I've written is called Scale. What was key to us growing our companies? And I'll tell you what it was. It's the answer to your question. These two skills. The first one is recognizing that leadership is not about running the business. It's about finding people smarter than you, trusting, empowering, and equipping them, and then getting out of the way. You can't scale until you can let go. And we scaled when we started to spend, I spent less time being CEO or running a company And I spent more time out of the office hunting for talent, finding amazing, amazing people don't wander into your office and they probably don't respond to your job posting because they're amazing and they have five job job offers queued up. They're not looking. You have to go find talent. Talent is way scarcer than funding. So I spent a lot of time creating the inverted pyramid. They don't work for me. I work for them. Your job as a leader is to build 
the company where all the best people in the industry want to work for you and nobody wants to leave. That's a lot more work and a different focus than running the company. So my companies grew when I stopped running them and found, spent my time, again, finding people smarter than me, building a great place for them to work, and then just serving them. It's kind of a servant leadership model. The second skill I think that was critical, um, I'll call it empathy, uh, but that might be a big word for me. It's really just listening. Okay? It's when it occurred to me that leaders feel like they should be talking. You go into a staff meeting, you're the, you're the CEO, the founder, everybody's looking at you, whatever, the manager. You're the boss in that room. Everybody's looking at you. So you feel like you should be talking. But what I discovered was leading is far more powerful if you spend the first 80% listening and then the ending 20% reaching a conclusion. So what that meant to me was that most people build a business from their conference room out. What do you do when you get a good idea? You go in your conference room with your team and you start drawing. But the smartest entrepreneurs, innovators, and companies build their product from the customer in. So the second I have an idea, I don't go to the whiteboard. I go to the car, the parking lot. I drive across town. I find the people I think are going to buy my business. I grab a pencil and a notepad, and I say, please, start talking. And I spend a day in the life listening to everybody I think might buy this product. So by the time I even start designing the product, I've been on a listening tour and I have a much better idea of what the market's actually willing to bear, what product they want, what they're willing to pay for. So those are the two things that really helped us scale, uh, was listening skills as a leader and comprehending that leader, leadership is a servant leader model. Your job is not to tell people what to do, it's to let smarter people than you do it. That is incredible. I almost, oh, I'm like having a sigh of relief because this sounds like such a humane way of building great businesses. And we were just talking before we started this podcast about how there's so many times people build these great quote unquote products that nobody buy, or they seem to just yes. not fit what the, what the customers really want. Is this a symptom of people designing these in a boardroom as opposed to just listening and talking to the customer? And how can we do better? I think that's absolutely a symptom of that because the quote conventional wisdom, I don't know, came out of Silicon Valley or whatever, um, was this concept of the MVP, the minimally viable product. And what they said was get a prototype, then build an MVP, then push it out in the world and see what people think. And, you know, I think people are getting mad at me at Silicon Valley. They invite me out there to speak. And I would tell them, if your first real input is the MVP, you're already too late. Um, what you need to do, like, like I said, what people need to do is schedule time out of your office. I schedule time to leave the office, change clothes, and go hang out where the customers were in the early days when we were launching the set of price line companies. Um, I used to change into jeans like every other Friday and go to a shop, go to a discount store. I would go walk around in a Kmart a Walmart or a grocery store, like I was shopping and just chat with people because my customer, even my own employees wouldn't have used our product. My customer was a low end discount shopper who here's an example. We actually tested this one day. If you make decent money and you like Coke, and you walk into a store and they sell Pepsi, you'll go to the next store. You're not just going to buy Pepsi if you drink Coke. You're not going to buy whatever Lay's if you like Ruffles. So what we did was when we tried that experiment in a higher end store, people said, where's the Coke? We only have Pepsi today or I'll come back tomorrow. Then we went to the lower end store, which is our customer. We put Coke and Pepsi side by side and we severely discounted one. And they walked up and they said, well, we prefer Coke, but the kids are drinking Pepsi this week. We said, well, you said you like Coke. And they said, not at this price. Our customer had a completely different way of running their life, which you can't see until you schedule time out of your office to spend a day in their life. That's how you can do this better. Find your customer, change clothes if you have to. I used to schedule every other Friday to be out of the office and just hanging. By the way, you're not selling. You're not wearing your, customer's lo your company's logo. You're just hanging in the diner, eating apple pie with people or wandering around the store with a shopping cart, listening to conversation and chatting with people. That's how you develop customer intimacy. That would solve a lot of the shelves full of products that nobody wants because nobody asked them before they built it. Damn, this, uh, this is so powerful. <laughs> it even reminds me of the time I, I used to sell a product, which was about, it was actually one of the more esoteric products we used to have at Mind Valley, which was around energy clearing sessions. And I went through the session myself and I was like, I, I, I don't see how this works for me. And I actually picked <laughs> up the phone 
for people that bought it the year before. And I asked you like, why did they buy? And I just started getting conversation with them. And one of them, his name was Chuck, was basically saying, oh my God, this is like a happiness booster pill. And I started telling my psychologist that I've been going to these sessions. And since I started doing these, I've been able to retain a job. And I'm like, that's why I need to sell it. That's, there you I, go. I need to sell to Chuck. And so I find that so under, why is it that it's so hard? And it seems like the higher up people are in an organization, the more they feel they have the right to be disconnected from the end yes. customer. Why does that trend happen? How do we, how do we it, stop that? It's, it is just amazing. One time I sold one of my companies to American Express and I went to a corporate meeting at a high level and I was trying to understand. And it's an interesting thing because big companies, they had so much internal bureaucratic and infrastructure stuff to do. They just never had time to leave the building. So I wasn't blaming big companies, but I was recognizing the reason why, you know, job growth, right? A new job growth, innovation, so much creativity comes out of little companies because they have the time to spend with the customer. So if you're a small customer, if you're a large company, there's no reason you can't start doing this. Tell your staff, I will not be here Friday. But you know, I, I've got to, with your permission, cover one thing about scale that's brand related because you just brought it up and it's really, really important. And one of the other reasons that people can't sell their product is that they don't know what their true brand asset is. And the brand asset, let me explain it this way, Jason. It's the one, one single most important reason anybody bought your product. And let me tell you something, it's usually not the thing you're marketing, right? And the reason why is because they don't have that conversation you just talked about having with customers or that you and I are talking about. So let me give you the example. When I ask, when people are selling a product, what they're trying to do is give you as many reasons as possible to buy the product. So they tell me, I'm gonna give you a real quick example. A guy that was came to me and he ha, he made metal he made uh, wall mounts for for projection TVs. Hang your flat screen TV on the wall, buy his mount. And he said, I managed to get my mount in in Walmart and Target on the shelf, but I'm not really selling it. So I said, What are you selling? And he said, Well, I want everybody to buy my product, so I'm selling every asset I have. That's that's intuitive to do that, but that's not how people really buy. So I said, Show me your packaging, and your website and your collateral. You know what it said? It said five things. It said our TV mounts. It said they're lightweight, they're easy to assemble, they fold up when not in use, they're competitively priced, and they're made out of the same steel as aircraft chassis. So that's the five things, because you're trying to tell everybody all the reasons to buy it. But here's an exercise for all your listeners. Your brand asset is the answer to this question. If you told a customer, tell me one and only one reason, one most important reason you do business with me or you bought my product. What is the one most important reason that you wound up deciding to buy an energy, you know, to go to an energy clearing uh, session with Mind Valley? That answer is your brand asset. And here's how I recommend all of your listeners do. I always tell people to do this send a text or an email. You guys should do this at Mind Valley to 10 or more customers, to 10 people that are already bought product from you and ask them this question. Give me the one most compelling reason. You can only pick one that you bought my product. And nine out of 10 people will give you the same answer. And I'm telling you, Jason, almost 10 out of the 10 times, it's not what's on your marketing collateral. It's not what you sold. So here's the example really quick, and then I'll end this. We go to um, Target. I tell this guy, come with me. Remember, his, we go in there and his, Walmart, his TV mount's hanging on the shelf. Everybody's TV mount, his says, again, Lightweight, easy to assemble, folds up when not in use, well, competitively priced and made of aircraft steel. And we're standing there and I'm pretending to buy the exercise I told you. I'm in a pair of jeans, tennis shoes. I'm pretending I'm buying a mount. And uh, people, I watch people pick. And then each time people, I waited for 10 to my own exercise, text 10 people and ask. I waited for 10 people. Each time a person bought his mount, I said this. Hey, I'm looking to buy a mount for my TV too. Why did you pick that one? Why did you go to Mind Valley? Why did you do business with my company? And here's what happened. 10 out of 10 people said this. They said, I don't know what the hell aircraft steel is, but I want one of those. 10 out of 10 people. So you know what we did? After asking people the one reason, we took everything off the package in giant letters. It says, the only TV mount made from aircraft steel. So my, and now we sell the hell out of them. So my question to anybody that is selling a product, if you want to scale it, Stop selling everything and find your brand asset. Ask yourself this question. 
what is my aircraft steel? And the way you find out is to ask 10 people who've already bought your product for the one most important reason they bought it. That is when everything I've ever done scaled when I got it down to the brand asset. And I did that by asking people to tell me what my aircraft steel was. I hope that was helpful. That was extremely helpful. And my God, Jeff, I think we're cut from the same cloth here because this is, this is gold. And I, I'm a salesperson myself. Like I love talking about these aspects that really go towards understanding the customer. That's really how you show the love to them. I, I already see we have so much insights we've covered. I feel like we can continue this conversation forever. And I wanted to bring this with a close. And today you're doing amazing works that I think should be highlighted. You know, in a world today, we want to see that there's more quality, more unity, less biases, less racism. And you were sharing with me an amazing story, which was all about how as companies during the COVID crisis, especially might be going through some struggles. You're doing some initiatives here to actually support Latino, black and other minority groups that are looking to get more funding from the government. And there was a huge data source that said that it was completely skewed. And I wanted you to share yes. more about that and what is it that you are doing and what is things that other people can do as business order to bring more of this equality in the world. Sure. So thank you very much uh, for, for teeing that up because it's really, really important to me. I, you know, was blessed enough by being an entrepreneur, uh, you know, to live kind of a life I never dreamed of. Our music company, we won a Grammy and our TV company, we won an Emmy and I got been traveled to 97 countries now. I've had way more blessings than I possibly deserve. And I, I made the commitment to giving back in any way I could uh, to try to, you know, settle that balance sheet a little bit. And uh, we were uh, talking to, I've been talking to small business owners and entrepreneurs all over the world since COVID hit. And we heard a common theme in the United States, which was that, and by the way, also in some other countries, but let's talk about what we did in the US. In our own country here, the government stimulus money targeted for small businesses, which was called the PPP, Paycheck Protection Plan, um, was not getting to minority owned businesses. Um, Latino owned businesses, 91% of them that applied got rejected. Black owned businesses, it was 91%. Similar numbers for women-owned businesses, for veteran-owned, for LBGTQ-owned businesses. And so when we looked into it, the message wasn't getting to them. It was culturally biased. There was, it didn't even matter why. Their answer was they weren't getting help. And so I have this quick saying I want to share that, you know, when people ask me, why don't you just retire and go golf? And it's four words that, uh, Jason, that, that get me up every morning. The four words are, I wrote years ago, there is no they. They don't help these people. When you wake up and you say, man, these minority businesses, they should give them some money. They should help the black owned businesses. They should help Latinos. There is no they. It's written in giant letters for years on my wall. It's you. And so by that <laughs> token, it's me. If you think there's a problem, then go fix it. So what we did was we created a grant program. And we, in this case, is my organization, Global Entrepreneurship Network, partnered with some friends at an amazing organization called Hello Alice, a small business company. And we created a grant program where we just started giving out $10,000 cash grants. It's not a loan like the government program, and it's not government money. Uh, it's private money being handed out to entrepreneurs, especially focused on minority-owned businesses, uh, to make sure that we're, we're just, we just want them to survive, right? There is no they, so we'll help them. Um, and. Uh, it's been a blessing. One of my close friends and business partners, who's an entrepreneur himself, uh, his name's Armando, but you guys know him as Pitbull or Mr. Worldwide. Um, his entrepreneurial venture into the music business turned out pretty well. Uh, Pitbull's been helping me, and if you Google that, you'll see that Pitbull and I have been doing public service television announcements to tell minority-owned small businesses that we have money for them and to come find us, and we'll help them get through this very difficult time. So. Again, I'm hoping that everybody takes a there is no they attitude. The more success you achieve, uh, the more debt you owe back to the rest of the world. And uh, you know, I hope that people will find a way to do that. We've been you know, very, very uh, happy that we found a way to make a difference in other people's lives right now. Jeff, this was an incredible interview. Thank you so much for sharing this wisdom and closing with such a powerful statement of there is no they, it's all us. It's on us to go and make the impact we want to see in the world. And for everybody listening here, I just want to recap here where we really went through an amazing journey of Jeff's career, where he just had these big ideas that looked for opportunities where he could actually bring value in industries that if he goes into aligns to his passions and his goals that he had in his personal sure. life. 
it just naturally flowed this way. And when he started having intention, he was able to create that value, be connected and become that go-to person for that industry. It was such a creative way that you can actually build value. And think about how you can apply this within your own company. If you're working in a large corporation, how do you become that go-to person for every other department? That way you become indispensable as an employee. Now, Fast forward over these crazy, amazing skills that you should be developing as a leader, which is a quality you should be developing regardless of your title. How do you become more of a servant leader, being in the service of your team, acknowledge the people that are smarter than you and make sure that they are using their skills to the best of their abilities as you use your skills to the best of your abilities. And one of those skills is to listen. Listen, listen to your team, listen to the customers, stay close to the customer because the more disconnected you are from them, so much waste gets created by products that get invented that don't serve a need or don't have a clear understanding of what problem you solve. Focus on that and you will see that businesses start creating the right thing that solves the real problems. And in closing, there is no they stick that message on a wall, such as Jeff has done himself. Because once you see all the success that comes into your life, you can count your blessing, count any privilege or chance that you had, depending on what group you are in and give back to any other group, especially in the positions that you can actually make a big difference. And here, Jeff is making a big difference. We all can make a small step. And so go out there, make that impact and keep being a superhuman. 